Welcome to Talking Giants presented by Simple Man Radio. I'm your host, Bobby Skinner, here with my co-host, Justin Pennick. And we've got ourselves a mailbag. Got some good questions. We're going to talk Saquon trade, Joe Judge behind the scenes, can he get a good OC, Rob Stale probably being gone. But honestly, I was really excited for this mailbag, and now all I have on the brain is Pat Hanlon versus former Giants scout Steven Veteroso, and I'm now Team Steve now that Pat Hanlon got all but heard about it. Can we give, can we give context around that? Like what's what's going on? Give it, give it quick. No, we'll it's you. You it. found it. You could we do some reading for some light reading to start the show? May, you know what? We'll do it at the end of the show because I do want to get into the seri- more uh, serious topics. All right. Um, They're fighting uh, a former giant scout and the head of Giants PR, which I find it to be funny that usually the head of PR is always going to say no comment. Well, he has comments, and everybody is making each other look worse. Or they cry about. People writing mean stories about a team that is clearly a failure. Bad. All right, but you know who's not a failure? Us. We're we're not failures. We're we're a, a, a success story. We're great. We're true great Americans, like Stephen Vetterosa would call some people. And because of that, uh, this episode was brought to you by four special people. Yes, John Sparrow. Hmm. John Spare, I feel like, has been like a day one, like, I've followed him on Twitter, he follows me back type thing. Yeah. Like, before I even did Talking Giants. Patrick Brown. That's that's a pretty boring name. but No, I, I, I love that name. I have a friend named Patrick who was, like, very similar to Patrick from Spongebob. Marvin Lambert, which Marvin's a good name. Um, Lambert. Miranda Lambert. Adam. Adam Lambert. And then Matt Deliker. Matt Delegates to the Deliker. Justin, who are these people before we get into these questions? Patreon.com slash Talking Giants is where uh, you Pat have Hanlon. to go. Page, Patreon.com. Pat, Pat, Rian, Stephen Verderosa.com slash Talking Giants. $2 a month. You get some fun perks. Bobby will send you a sticker and magnet when he mess when you subscribe and you message him and then a couple times a month two times a month if you're a two dollar tier you get then some more times if you're a ten dollar tier uh you possibly can win some free shirts and you hang out with us live you help us come up with tweets like before today's show i was trying to formulate a bad tweet and it wasn't that funny but i did it patreon.com slash no, it was actually guys. not funny at all but i'm now, I'm, I'm trying to be a nice guy not say dis- i was disappointed in it all right let's get into this uh this mailbag steve take it away Mail time. Mail time. The mail's here. Come on. Bye, guys. Here's the mail. It never fails. It makes me want to wag my tail. When it comes, I want to wail. Mail! All right. Thanks, Steve from Blues Clues. Justin, let's get into the mail. Second to last mailbag of the year, or last this mailbag is, of the year, technically. Yes, le- last mailbag of the calendar year. First question is coming from Clean House, all caps, exclamation point, saying the Giants record. Really rude. At Charles underscore Rogalia. Rogalia. That's probably it. Do you guys think the Giants should give Saquon Barkley one more chance to shine next year, or do you believe that the ship has sailed? I feel like the ship has sailed, Justin, and here's and here's why. Not even just because Saquon has been bad this year. There really is no best case scenario of him coming back. It's either he plays the year on the last year of his contract, the fifth year, the fifth year option, which is and and plays and and plays badly, and it's like, well, what do we do now? Do we resign him? Like, do we let him walk? Like, you know, a bad a bad situation. Or he plays really good and you have to pay him a contract because you draft him second overall and John Mayer medals and everything and he's not going to have Saquon ball out next year, which if, like, and I don't really have any confidence that that's going to happen. So, like, I I think for the new GM and Joe Judge, priority number one, not your most important thing, but, like, the first thing on that you guys get ready to do as when the league calendar year starts is like we we need to start working the phones and get a Saquon Barkley t- a trade done. Like that should be option number 1 cuz I don't I don't see there being any good options. It would be one thing if it was year 2 and you had 3 4 years left of his rookie contract, which is still high for a running back. But I just I, I don't think there's any win of bringing Saquon back besides him affecting the year like if if we have, you know, 
go to the playoffs or something and he he goes back to his old self. Like that's not, and and that's very short term thinking. Yeah, I was going to break it down from the practicality standpoint of well, what should the Giants do and then the player standpoint of oh, well, you know, what can he be like coming back from the second year? And the practicality standpoint is exactly like you said. We keep him and if he doesn't perform well, then it's either a very low contract extension, which why, or you let him go. And then again, that's another Giants player that we let go that we didn't trade at the trade deadline where we even could have gotten... Don't even wait till the trade deadline. Something, right. Don't even wait till the trade deadline. We want it done this offseason. Or if he performs well, then it's, oh crap, we got to pay him. And then, you know, you're seeing what teams are going through. You know, Dallas is going through this right now with them. It's that they're kind of cap stricken in some areas, but they have Tony Pollard who is performing just as well as Ezekiel Elliott. So that's the situation there where you just don't want to pay him. And the Giants, they cannot pay Saquon Barkley. No, and Um, that should be the conversation about Saquon. Like, now we need to talk about him as a player and what he's going to be like. But I think the main conversation is like, hey, this is the last year of his deal, and we should not be paying this player, regardless no. if he, even if he bounces back because of the running back position and the value of that. And and honestly, when Saquon's at his best, there is big, like big plays, and he does affect games, and he does add wins to the team. But it's like Saquon doesn't do the every down stuff. And maybe he would with a good offensive line, which he hasn't had in four years. But – we don't know. We don't know that it would. And we look at. I mean, look at this year. Bar- Booker has more. Has eleven less carries. So they essentially have the same amount of carries, Justin. And he averages a yard more per carry, four and a half yards per carry. And I know that's not the perfectly fair to do because there, it's it's not it's not apples to apples. But you know what? Devontae Booker shouldn't have eleven less carries than Saquon Barkley, and have seventy more yards. That should that shouldn't happen no matter what. Let's just break it down this way, too. Devontae Booker's expected yards per carry versus his actual yards per carry, right? And the difference, you want there to be a positive difference there, where you want the actual yards per carry to be more than the expected yards per carry, because expected yards per carry, that's almost like the offensive line stat of what is a running back expected to do in a given situation. For Devontae Booker, it's positive. Now, it's not tremendously positive, but it is a positive number. For Saquon Barkley... It is a negative number. His expected yards per carry is less than his raw yard. Or I'm sorry, it's more. His expected yards per carry is more than his raw yards per carry. And that's not what you want. That's in the negative. So um, this is just a bad, bad, bad situation. Where even people have given the, you know, the some people that have been more optimistic about Saquon have said, well, he's not healing. He hasn't healed from the ankle. Well, he he started to heal from the knee injury with the Saints game, but then he got the ankle injury against Dallas. Well, and that that's might also, be fair, but wh- why should we trust Saquon to stay healthy? That's also why the should- point where it's like, okay, when is he going to heal? When are we going? If we get a healthy Saquon Barkley for two weeks and then something else comes up, then it's going to be even more excuses of, oh, now we got to wait until he heals up. That's That's the point about the running back position. It's not necessarily just a reflection on Saquon. It is just a reflection on the running back position in the game of football in 2021. So again, that's why I think it should be like the first thing on the books. And what's so frustrating about this franchise is, you know, John Merritt, it's going to, I have been, so we'll talk about Joe judge later, but I am more like, I, there's actually like some like stuff that's like, man, maybe behind the scenes, I do kind of like some of the stuff Judge does as like organization day to day stuff. But what I hate is that John Mayer medals and everything, you know. And it's like it's it's like a it's a constant battle versus John Mayer for the Giants. It's so frustrating. And I know and it's, it's like yes, he too has taken second over. Like, and there's like there has been like a top like Joe Judge should bench Saquon for Booker. You can't. You no, can't you do cannot. that. Even if you, th- even if it was the right decision football wise, you can't bench Saquon Barkley. He was drafted second overall. He's a, like he, you're, he's a huge figure. Like you just can't, you can't do that. You can't do that. You can shut him down for the last two weeks, even though that's not going to happen. But like the idea of just benching Saquon, like you can talk about, oh, Joe Judge said he's going to play. Like no, you can't. You cannot bench Saquon Barkley. That's and even just compared not to even compared to Week One, where the reps were supposed to be 50-50, right? We're going to ease Saquon Barkley back from the injury. This past week against the Eagles was the closest that we saw to really a split two-headed backfield than any other week. Am I right in saying that? 
I, I don't know. I, 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 I felt like Booker and Saquon were splitting reps fairly decent, whereas when I mean, Saquon has like been 75, there... 25 I, I felt like I saw Booker more. No, more often. Not more than Saquon, but just more often in general compared to when the two running backs were healthy. That's what I felt. Don't have numbers on it. I'm going to look it up real quick. Saquon yeah, had 15 carries. Devontae Booker had... Six. So yeah, it was seventy five twenty five. Oh, okay. It, it that's felt a game like with Booker was on the field more. To. Yeah. What's funny is they look exactly alike and their numbers are very similar. So there's times where it's like, is that Saquon or Booker? Which I have trouble saying that yeah. sometimes. Which that that's the point. The conversation and I've been saying this for weeks, even when you were kind of doubting me. The announcers me a little have bit. screwed it up. Um even when you were doubting me for a little bit, my whole point is that the gap between Saquon and Devontae Booker should not be close. And it is. Yeah, and that that is not good. All right, next question. I have one, just one more question Whoa. on that. Hey, who's yelling? Go for it. Gun to your head. I love this. Gun to your head. Is Saquon Barkley on the team next year? Yes. It's not even a thought. Shouldn't be, but he, it's easily he will be. I have to do more research into second year. Gun to your head. Pull the trigger. Yeah, for me, for me, you would pull that trigger. Um, I have to do more research on, and it's this is all rooted in the fantasy football stuff of guys coming back from their second year of the ACL. I, I, I not just saying it because do you I think know Saquon's going to be back on the Giants next year. No. Really, you actually believe that? Like you're not I hoping think, for it. You I actually think change, believe it. I think changes are coming to the team. I think they are going to get an outside GM in here. And I think I do too. It just, it makes sense. It just makes too much sense. It's never made more sense. All right. Next question. Next question. Enter name here. Enter name here. 33. Does the Saquon dodging the press conference thing actually bother you too? Do you feel he hasn't been scrutinized enough by the media? Um, I think he has on the Twitter space. I think it's lame to look at, only because his play has been terrible. I think that was be media some clowns. Like I, I saw. I just don't care about press con- like doing. I don't know. Like would if Saquon talked in the front of the media. Like I, I don't know. Like what? Yeah. Were you gonna really listen to it and really take what he said under consideration? Well, it's not. Like, he doesn't no. even talk to. Like they don't even put those videos up. Those are like literally phone call meetings on Monday. No, he didn't. I guess he didn't talk after the game, which he usually does. And he, I, I, it's. I just don't care about press conferences. And I don't think New York media is tough as people make it out to be either. I think they're actually kind of soft. No, I, I don't I don't really care about it either. And, you know, I, I evaluate Saquon Barkley based off of what he does on the field. And, hey, if you don't want to talk to the media, then it's it's a, it's not a great look. But also, here's the thing. And but I also, like, don't care. Like, is, yeah, should he do it? Should he do it? But I don't care. Jordan Ronan made the point, and this was a good point. While the media, I think, can get salty that... Those guys, and if say if I if I was a beat reporter and Saquon Barkley didn't show up to me, I'd kind of be a little PO'd, and I I understand where they're coming from. But he did make a good point. Eli Manning would speak to the media on Monday, even though he didn't have to after a loss, so everybody else didn't have to. So, dude, you want to be the franchise, and you want to think of yourself as the franchise, the number two pick, then you got to be there. That's also my perspective of if you want to wear that mantle and if you want to carry that load, then you better be about it, dude. Yeah, he should, but it's just also, I just don't care. But I don't, right, I, I also don't care about it. But that is also the, the only player I care that speaks to the media is Kadarius Tony. For selfish reasons. Yeah. If Tony wouldn't talk to the media, then I'd be pissed off. All right. Um, next question. All right. Chris Mickle. How does it feel to get ratioed by Tim Coffey? And in all seriousness. Stats. In all seriousness, it was a horrible season, but you guys made it better. Keep killing it. Can't wait for more draft videos on Talking Football. Add Tyler Linderbaum video on the Talking Football channel. Spent a lot Go of time watch on that. It. Huh? Spent a lot of time on it, too. Spent a lot of time on it. And then Tim Coffey asks, what's your opinion on Rob Sale as offensive line coach? Would a new offensive coordinator even want to keep him? So first of all, I got my first ratio. I tweeted Congrats. out Monday morning. 
Mike Lennon is my choice to start a quarterback for the New York Giants as they travel to take on the Chicago Bears. And yep. I took I did a picture of Glennon and Giants jersey and a Glennon and a Bears jersey. That got 219 likes. Tim Coffey, who was crying for Jake Fromm, from a night nation, Jake Fromm, from a night nation, <laughs> last week, <laughs> says, who effing cares anymore and got 686 likes, which is a wow. bona fide ratio. And That's came, a huge ratio. Who came to Tim Coffey, who's one of our, our you know, like, you know, Hall of Fame listeners, and he ratioed me, and it was, I was, I was just like, I can't believe Tim, I, I probably would rather have it be someone like Tim Coffey than you know some random person who than would me. actually feel co- like then. Well, no, like if if like some like actual person who like thought I sucked, um, got me and like, ooh, look, I ratioed Bobby, um, but I was I was a little bothered. It's like I can't believe freaking Tim Coffey was the person giving my first ratio. And out of all out of all of our listeners, he would be the one to openly brag about that. That's also the thing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I ratioed it's, Bobby. It's, well, Tim, he told me because I was messaging him, and he said, "Uh, he's like I had to Google what ratio is, and I still don't know." <laughs> um, which is it's just like you get more likes on a reply than the person does on the regular tweet. Yes, by a good amount. Um, but what was the Rob Sale question from Tim Coffee? Yeah. Um, Rob Sale. Th- thank you, Chris Mickle, for the compliment. Um, he's in the chat right now. What's your opinion on Rob Sale as offensive line coach? Would a new offensive coordinator even want to keep him? I think the second question is irrelevant because I don't think he's going to be here. Yeah, Rob Sale's going to the Gators. That's that's happening. Like this, when the season's over, Rob Sale's going to the Gators. Um, and it's a shame because I actually thought that for the circumstances and the really shit crap circumstances that he got this year with the old line that he got, I thought he. Did all right. He did an all right job. And so I, you know, obviously I do the O-line stuff. Like, that's where I spend my time. Here's the one black eye on Rob Sale and what, and, and is Will Hernandez. Mm. Will Hernandez had the worst season of his career this season. That's the black eye. That's the black eye on Rob Sale. And Will, Will Hernandez, out of the four other starters, probably has the best physical tools. But do you view that as a reflection of Rob Sale or Will Hernandez? Because they were now COVID played an impact last year, and we know that. However, that coaching staff let and Joe Judge and DeGuglielmo and Colombo, they were benching him last year. So they brought him back as a starter though. That with no other really real option. Um so that's the black guy. But here's the thing I do think Rob Sale's a good offensive line coach. I mean, I gotta give him some. You gotta give him some credit for for Andrew Thomas, right? Right? Like, like, like he gives some credit, and and you know the the preseason game where you know we worried about Andrew Thomas afterwards. Andrew Thomas has become a much more confident, consistent player, and he's even starting to add some more like moves to his repertoire in the pass game. Uh, even in the run game, there's more to be desired moving wise, but it's like he's just he's just a more confident, consistent player. Like every pass set. Is, is exactly what Andrew Thomas wants to do. And remember we talked about it on um on the Sundays, like, man, he gave up the QB hit on on, on that Fromm play, like where Parrot's guy blew up. That was Fromm and Billy Price didn't set the right protection. They that was a quick set protection for a three step drop quick play, while it was a deep concept five step drop. That was on Billy Price and Jake Fromm. So they set the wrong protection. So it's like even that rep where it's like, man, Thomas got beat bad. It's like, oh wow. Well, now it, it makes sense, like, because Thomas doesn't lose like that. Like he he loses some reps, but he doesn't lose like that. Um, the sack rate has went uh from eight point eight percent to five point three percent, with a worst a worse overall offensive line. Now yeah. Andrew Thomas is better, and that's the biggest portion of that. But still, that does matter. And that's about average. If you're wondering, well, what's that compared to league average? I would say Dan even with Daniel Jones. As quarterback, the sack rate was slightly below average compared to the rest of the National Football League. I was following that every week. And, you know, obviously Jones got better at manipulating his pocket with Thomas, you know, so that that obviously has some impact. But that's also without Nick Gates looking for work, where Billy Price never finds work and never helps his guys out, really. Um, you know, Billy Price can do an all right job when he's one-on-one, but he never helps out anybody. Um. He just got bad players. Like, and let's like let's. Did, you, did Matt Skur have any huge technique issues? Like, no. Like, did Billy Billy Price have some stuff? But it's like, yeah, Billy Price had that in Cincinnati, and he got better as the season went along. Was and didn't have any like had zero days of camp with the New York Giants and Rob Sale. 
Nate Solder is soft. Nate Solder is washed. He is not. He's not like he's not an NFL player anymore. Matt Parrott, you know, we talked about it in our PPP and, and with him, and we we are pretty positive in those. And but it's like it's just like man, I understand you want to coach him, but I don't know if he's ever going to be an aggr- an aggressive player in in pass blocking. Like, and they pass tried. Blocking's not pass blocking is not passive. You know, and like you said, he he did try. So I do think Rob Sales a loss. I don't think it's like the worst loss in the world. You know, I'm not. It's not like we're losing some great offensive coordinator. I'm like, I don't. This sucks. But I do view Rob Sale as a loss. Yeah, they certainly did try with Matt Parrott. You know, we weren't there every day in camp, but the two three days that Snacks and I were in Massachusetts, I mean, it was every day. It was uh, uh Wilkerson, the assistant offensive line coach, and Sale. They were getting in Matt Parrott's face and. I think they really tried to, you know, it was one of it was those conversations where it's the coach that tries to get more out of you versus, you know, uh, hey, how you doing, buddy? You know, one of those lighthearted conversations. So, uh, and the offensive in terms of looking at weighing Rob Sales' potential future loss that will be, you know, the offensive line coach is the most important position coach. You've said that over and over again, Bobby. So, you know, it's not the biggest loss, but it's going to be a loss that. You know, we're going to have to follow where that was the main thing that we were following this past offseason, not firing Jason Garrett and not not hiring another coordinator, but bringing back or looking for an offensive line coach. That was the thing that we were following the most. And I just had to improvise talking because Bobby Skinner started sneezing and he always sneezes for 20 seconds. Um, yeah, I do sneeze for a long time. Um, I'm really pissed off that we're not, uh. We're not being a part of this Pat Hamlin versus Stephen Verderosa. Where it's like, I know I could just be sitting on fire and off jokes. The one time, the one time recording late bites us in the ass. This is the first time that it's ever happened. Yeah. Um, we have to do something, by the way. We have to do something for episode, uh, I think we're approaching 300 or 400. What are we, we approaching? We don't have to do anything. We're, what do you mean we're not going to do anything? What are we going to do? We're going to throw a party? Yes, exactly. We're approaching because episode four hundred. Four hundred. Can you believe that? What I can't. Are we on right now? Three ninety. We'll see. All right. Um. Next you're, question. You're boring. Um. Jesse Samino. At Jesse P. I'm curious. Oh what damn it! I forgot to do the research for this question. Oh no. Here, all right, ask the question and I'll do my best job. I was supposed to do research on this question and I didn't yeah, do it. Yeah, I, I, was, I was really banking on you doing the research for this question. Ah, I'm curious shit. about the draft position implications for the game this weekend. If the Giants win, lose, or tie the Bears, what are the possible draft position scenarios? Hoping that rooting for a Giants W is the best option for us in the long run as well. Brian Colburn also asked a similar kind of question and I want to give him a A few people out. did. Yes. Um, shout out Brian Colburn. Are you looking for it right now? I can show something. Well, I'm looking at Tankathon right now. And it basically so right now we have the fifth and the eighth pick. And the Bears are five and ten. The Panthers are five and ten at the seventh pick. The Seahawks the, uh, are five and ten at the sixth pick. So there's we're we are the lowest of the four and eleven teams. The Bears are the lowest of the five and ten teams. Now the strength of schedule stuff can change. So I, I guess it matters what you value more do you value the giants pick getting higher and hoping that the jets or the uh texans win a game i don't think they're going to win a game though i think the jets have the pats and the bills left so they're not going to win a game no they're not and i don't think the texans are going to win a game either yeah and i mean listen they can they get a surprise yeah so it's like do you want to get up there and like get you know get the best edge or make sure you get an evan neal type player or do you value getting that bears pick higher higher um Texans have if the 49ers. You could, if you could tell me the Texans or the Jets would win a game, I would say that the best thing would be for the Giants to lose to get that one higher pick. You know, because like even if the Bears fall down to like 11 or 12, it's like you're still going to get a really good, like there's going to be a really good player available at a position you most likely want at those spots. Texans have the 49ers and the Texans for their final two games of the year. And the Texans the Jets, have the 49ers and the Texans? The te- the Te- yeah, Texans, 49ers, and, Tit- and Titans. Titans, okay. And so they'll probably lose both those games. The Jets have the Bucks and the Bills, excuse me. So Tom Brady is basically the Patriots. So I would say that the best thing is for the Giants to win. Um, now the Panthers or the Seahawks could jump us and we fall down the six. Um, 
But I, I can see Seattle winning a game. I don't even have to look at their schedule, but I could just see Seattle winning a game. Yeah. Carolina um, mm, probably not winning anything. So I think it'd probably be best for the Giants to win the game um, and get that Bears pick higher. Can I say something? I want to trade out of that Bears pick. Yeah, I, we got some we got some questions on that about I, I'm kind of for depending on how the board will shake up and depending on how the pro, how we're viewing prospects. You know, if there's not if the if we're if we view a tackle or an edge rusher as more of a priority versus the other, then trade down. Or are we going to talk ourselves into just continuing to invest in the secondary and edge rusher isn't the biggest priority in the world and we nah, just they rock know and edge roll. is a priority. Um, but you could still acknowledge it without. It, it would be half-ass acknowledging it, but I, feel like I wanna, needs to be I want to. I want to stay. I, I would. I if depend. It, like I said, it depends how the board shakes out. I want to grab a top-tier edge rusher. I don't want to. I don't want to mess around and like. Oh, we're gonna develop this guy. Exactly. I want a top-tier guy. Exactly. But I, I now again, it's totally made up right now to say I want to trade back because there's got to be an offer there. But I would do the Bears trade all over again. Like you drop nine spots, get an extra first, get a third and a fifth. Like. I'll do that 10 times out of 10 and I won't cry that Micah Parsons is on another team. I won't. Um, I like, I love that trade. I would do that trade 10 times out of 10. So I would say the best thing is when you look at it, it can get worse, but I think the best thing is for the giants to win and the bears could, I can see the bears beating the Vikings in the last week and ending up with seven wins. If they beat us and the Vikings, and then they could be like in a a big tie and fall down to like 13 or something like that. So, I think best case scenario, I think the best thing is for the Giants to win this game. Okay. Now, that was all, you know, not well researched. We literally did the research on the spot. So, so sorry. Ready for the next one? Next one. Adam Marshall present at I present underscore and present. Would you rather have to fight... 100 duck-sized Mike Glennons or one Mike Glennon-sized duck? You answer first, because I feel like this is the easiest answer of all time. Well, I mean, I would rather fight one of anything versus 100 of something, and I feel like that's the cliche classic answer. Also, one Mike Glennon-sized duck, you know how how big that neck is? And then I just go for the throat. It's the easiest answer ever. And I can't believe we did a Twitter poll and they got it wrong. They said 100 duck sized Glennons. That's scary. 100 a duck of anything is the scares easiest me. thing in the world to kill if you want to kill it. And it's like, oh, look, it's big and it's tall like Mike Glennon now. It's like, like you said, you just grab that neck and you literally just Hulk smash it like bam, bam. And guess what? Birds have brittle bones. Now, they'll be a little thicker because he's growing, but they have very brittle bones so they can fly. Like, I would destroy destroy a Mike Lennon sized duck. Like you said, you grab it by the neck. It has no hands to grab you with. No. Like once you grab it by the neck, it's no teeth. Done. And people will say, well, you know, ducks can be aggressive. So like you see videos of like ducks going after people and the people look like idiots and the, it looks like the duck wins. You want to know why? One, there's mo- those are usually idiots. And two, that person's not trying to kill the duck. They're trying to get away from the duck because they're not savages and don't want to just kill a duck. If a duck attacked me, like outside i would probably look like an idiot and it would look like oh look the duck chased this big guy off if the duck attacked me and i said you know what i'm going no mercy that duck would die on the spot and it being taller has no effect on me a hundred si- duck size mike linens ducks are I can get a decent height and hands that you can grab at and cl- like you, this it's it's not even a, it's not even a question i feel like because they're so small, I I'm wouldn't glad you wanna... got this one right. I was worried you were going to get it wrong. No, no. I was wor- because like objects are so small, I don't want to be aggressive towards those small moving living beings versus yeah, but you're if, fighting. If something is big and they charge me, I feel much more comfortable to fight yeah, my ground. We're talking you had a $100,000 like fight on the line versus a, versus this, not like trying to be nice to something smaller. Um so, no, my yeah, point, that... my psyche, my psyche, when I see, even if like one duck was attacking me, 
I would be hesitant. I'm not going to, I don't well, really yeah, you want don't to kick kill this a duck. duck, but this is a fight. This isn't like you being a normal human okay. in society. All right. This episode is brought to you by Simple Man Radio. Wow. We're doing an ad for a show that we're on. Wow. That's just freaking like, you know, it's like a worm eating its tail. Snake eating his tail. That's basically what this is, is right now. Simple Man Radio. It's coming back Thursday on the Simple Man Radio channel and the podcast apps if you want to listen to the podcast later. It's essentially going to be us screwing. We don't have... We, we need to plan it out a little bit tomorrow. Tomorrow we need to kind of talk about the plan. But like, so here's an idea. I want to have Steven Verderoso on and troll him and have him not realizing I'm trolling him. Like that's something I want to do on Simple Man Radio. We'll talk about John Madden. Um, you know. So we'll, we'll we'll try and have some fun with it. Um, you have, it'll probably be the downfall of us. But you have we, an idea. Yeah, it's having Steven Verderoso on. No, no, not just that. I want you to pitch something. I don't know what you're talking about. You had an I've idea. I've had a bunch of ideas for Simple Man Radio. You had an idea about a children's show. I, I mean, I thought we were going to save that for Simple Man Radio. But, but basically, uh, I want a yeah. sort of popular children's show like Blue's Clues or Door or something. And then, like, four years into it, like, kill off one of the main characters in a brutal way, and it never comes back. Not like... I have I have an idea for it. That would be hilarious. You would That would be the funniest thing to ever happen in the world. Can imagine I give you if, a... Imagine if, like, the, the pink dog on Blue's Clues was, like, ran over, and it's like, oh my god, she's dead, and she just never comes back. So, Dora, right? The monkey is killed off. Yeah. They kill the monkey. Fox, the fox, shows up to the yeah, funeral. Yeah, kill the fox, actually. I want to kill a fox. No, 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 because the fox is bad, but listen to this. So, no, but do you, Have monkey... you seen the Borat video when he goes as uh, when he's he goes to, uh, this is not from the movie, it's from, from Ali G, where he goes and to, like, the people who are, like, against, you know, hunting animals, and they're, like, they're protesting, and they're like, why do you kill the fox? And he says, uh... Uh, for fun, and they, they it's it's a great video. Maybe I could, actually I can't find it. We'll probably get demonetized on YouTube. Boots dies. Um, the fox shows up to the funeral. Dora's like, "Get the f out! I don't want you here. You stole shit from me for years. What no, are you see, doing?" No, I don't want that. I literally just want to kill it off and then act and then go back to a merry old show. Okay, and act like you, that episode's horrible and just act like nothing happened. All right, I'll write my own script for it. You write your own script for it. And there you go. Between uh between the 100 duck size Mike Lennons and uh that conversation, that's basically what Simple Man Radio was going to be. Except Little snacks, less gimmicky, but uh it's, snacks it's, is going to be there and uh Danny and King's sometimes Danny King. All right, next question. Next question. Kevin Donahue at Kevin P. Donahue. Any reason when Judge says that they're not taking shortcuts and they're doing things the right way to believe in him? The trade back could be an example of doing it the right way. Seems like it's becoming a talking point as a blanket excuse for why they are bad. Part of me just wants to hire Joe Judge as GM and fire and find a new head coach. You know, like I think Joe Judge behind the scenes and it is done a good job, like firing guys like Steve Arosa, who's like, man, you don't deserve a job here. Like, I don't care if you've been here a long time. You don't deserve a job here. Um, We've liked the drafts the past two years, even though I don't like that. The the biggest black mark of the way they've done things the last two years was not addressing offensive line at all in 2021. But it's like you look at the last two off seasons and you kind of like what they did for the most part. Like, yeah, the Kyle Rudolph is a bad one. But for the mo- you know for the most part, you you like what they did, even ones that are criticized. Like Devontae Booker has been averaging four and a half yards per carry, more than a yard per carry uh, over Saquon Barkley, and he's able to be used as a spellback and when he uses gets volume, um, which is the difference between him and Wayne Gallman, and he's more involved in the receiving game. Austin Johnson was another really criticized one. He's been a good player. Yeah. Um, you know, so I, <clears throat> I. I I like Judge behind the scenes. The issue is that he's the head coach, and they haven't looked good on the. They've been bad on the field, you know. But I do I do think Judge has changed the things a little bit. But the issue is I think I I just he, I think he's always going to be fighting against Mara. But I also think that's whoever it's going to be, you know. Yeah, this is also why I wish I was there to see more practices because then I would be able to comment on. A Joe Judge practice versus a Pat Shermer practice versus a Ben McAdoo practice, which I did see those those processes and those practices, and they were not they were they were not good. They didn't have energy. Um, 
it didn't seem like the team was improving. And lo and behold, you saw it on the football field. Those teams did not improve. The Giants did not improve either. Um, but the the biggest black cloud that has been over this Giants team the last two years has been the offense. And we've been Jason talking. Jason Garrett was forced on him. Was, yeah, that's, like, that's exactly what I was going to say. Him. That's exactly you know? what I was going to say. It, it, it's, it is kind of confirmed, and I do believe where in the past – we have been very laissez-faire saying, you know what? We don't know if Jason Garrett was forced on Joe Judge. We're still judging Joe, you know, no pun intended. We're still judging Joe Judge on the offense because it's his system. No, I think we we know it now. We know that Jason from, Garrett was forced on Joe Judge. From reading and the that, tea leaves of Columbo to Judge and then hearing it from articles and like, you know, we, people talk to us. It's like, yeah, it, it, it's, it's like almost like I'm 95% sure that like, they didn't say flat out like you need to fight higher Garrett, but they basically like made him like essentially made him higher Garrett, which is what gives me, which is what ruins my any chance of hope. You know, it's just like this because they're because they're doing the same thing with Joe Judge and Dave Gettleman right now, yeah. where it's like it or or Joe Judge and and Daniel Jones, um, and more so Judge than Jones, but it's like it's like they're doing it again. You know, they're asking GM candidates, would you work with, would you be willing to you know keep Judge and Jones yeah. for a year and see what happens. And they you also know. made Garrett stay this year, which that's the biggest thing. If you want to hire him last year, if, if ownership wants to hire him last year, great. But I think Joe Judge did enough in 2020 where if he turned to John Mara and said, I don't want to keep this guy around and I want to bring in somebody somebody of my own liking, and John Mara still said no, then again, that just points to the whole Broken, 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 broken process. Um, and there's other things like we, Dave Gettleman was like, was like, stop saying the Giants can trade back. He's literally never traded back in like eight drafts. He traded back twice in this draft. Yeah, traded back twice. We have nine picks, and we traded away two picks, and during training camp they grab players. So it's like behind the scenes, I I like what he's doing, but it's, it just seems like a never ending fight versus uh, John Mayer. So yeah. that's kind of what this question was based off of. But at the same time, it's like, well, what players have developed? McKinney has developed really well throughout the year. Like he wasn't this, he was bad at the start of the year. Like he was a player I was criticizing a lot at the start of the year. Um, Do you point Tay Crowder as a negative for not developing him? No, because Tay Crowder was never supposed to be the number one inside linebacker. Like Tay Crowder to me is a, is a success story. Um, I agree. You know, getting a guy like Darnay Holmes ready, you know, like as a rookie, you know, after the fourth round and knowing you can't put him in man and, and stuff like that. Rodarius um, Williams. Yeah, Rodarius was like playing, um, and not playing badly either. So, um, you know, and this year, like, it has but like Blake Martinez had a career year. James Bradbury had a career year. Um, the only, the, the, only, the, the and, biggest, but the issue is the offense is so bad. Yeah, and Joe Judge is not an offensive or defensive play caller, so it's hard. To, so you look at like in game stuff, the fourth down, which we've been criticizing um, since last year. You know, um, which by the way, when people say we aren't cur- like. I can actually. I'm not. I'm, I was gonna pat ourselves on the back, but I'm not gonna do it. But anyways, it's like at the end of the day, his job is to be a head coach, and he's won ten games in the first two seasons, and that's yeah, that's not enough. And I know there's been injury injuries have hurt them. They truly have. But ten games through two years is not enough. They went from six wins to four wins on a roster that was supposed to that beat reporters were picking to win nine games this season. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Uh, everybody, everybody was doing it. Even, even national media people were smart national media people. Dan Orlovsky said that the Giants and Washington were going to finish top two in the division this year. So, um, and we and we like him. So, all right, next question. AJ Indovina at AJ Indovina. Can the Giants realistically hire an innovative slash aggressive offensive coordinator to pair with the conservative minded head coach? Assuming Judge is back, seem like those two things aren't possible together. Kitchens is aggressive, yeah. maybe even a little too aggressive sometimes. But Kitchens is aggressive. Now he still runs like you know, he he runs the ball uh, a lot, which I honestly don't blame. What the personnel at QBs had, um, they run a lot of slant flat type stuff. But Freddie Kitchens is aggressive, so. Yes, I think the answer to that is yes. Um, we know Garrett was essentially forced on him. Now, will he get a good offensive coordinator who's an innovative mind? Like, I don't know. If he brings back Freddie Kitchens, I'm going to be really down on on them. Uh, but if he goes in the house and somehow gets his Dable from, or Ken Dorsey from Buffalo, or, you know, who are, we haven't done our research yet, so we're throwing out names. Um, 
Plus, I'm sure he's learned a little bit. Like the way we did offense clearly didn't work, even if even if he was super involved with it. <laughs> yeah, it's it seems like he has ties to people, and by by AJ saying aggressive, I think he might mean high pass rate. Um, high pass rate along with throwing, having the deep concepts down the field. And Joe Judge has had ties to people with high pass rates, and he has wanted to bring in people like Dabble, which that is, you know, that's a that's a confirmed that's a confirmed rumor, I guess, that he wanted to bring in that he wanted to interview Dabble and bring in Dabble, but Buffalo didn't allow him. The fourth down stuff I don't see changing much. Might change a little bit, but not much. No, and, and like we've said before, if the Giants can just score more points on a consistent basis, I will be a lot more okay and fine with punting or kicking a field goal every once in a while. I'll be a lot more okay with it if we can score seven points more consistently and produce explosive plays. Yeah, so there is there is definitely like you know the fourth down stuff. Um, like I don't see maybe that he does get much. more aggressive. Maybe he does get more aggressive. Yeah, if- but it's he's shown pretty consistently that he's not aggressive with fourth down. Like I don't I don't like the offensive play caller stuff. I do see it fourth down. Again, maybe a little more, like, but he's never going to be aggressive. On, he'll never be in the top 20 of the league on fourth down aggressive. What was going through his head during that Cleveland game last year, Sunday Night Football? What what, what made that game? Because now we have more games without Daniel Jones with backup quarterbacks, too. Why was it that game that that was the game where we were going to be super, super aggressive? And you can make an argument too aggressive on, on that game. Why? Maybe he wanted Jason Garrett fired. He's like, let's score. We got to score as literally as many points as possible. <laughs> uh, I, I don't, I don't know. I, I, I think that was just like, you know, he's not a robot. You know, I, I, I don't. I think that was like, hey, we know we got, we're going to be aggressive in this game. We got this trick play called and blah blah blah. Um, but even in that game, he wasn't aggressive because they got the ball at the forty, like at like the forty-two at the end, like the, the start of the second half, and they got it down and they punted. You know, down like 13 points or whatever it was. So they weren't even, I, there was even like a really unaggressive moment in that game. So um, by nature, he's not going to ever be aggressive on fourth down. Might get a little better. Might not be the bottom three in the league of that, but he might, but he's never going to be in the top 20. It's crazy how all Belichick disciples, th- especially this year, you know, I've been keeping, really keeping track of it this year. All Belichick disciples are almost all of them are at the bottom of the league. Flores. Judge and Belichick himself have been very, very conservative with going for it on fourth down during certain decisions where they should be going for it. Bill Belichick's fault. All right, next question. Renato Parente at Parenti 9. Are you folks able to understand Jabril Pepper's cryptic tweets? I took pictures of these. Oh, really? See, I, I, I've i seen a couple show up, um, but I didn't think much of them. But I'm like, that is kind of cryptic. So I, what I say is I'm not going to look at um, it until right now. So I'm going to pull it up. We're going to go through I, the last I, week I, of tweets. I have them. I have some. Well, let's just go. I, I mean, I have them right in front of me. Let's see. Um, you have to go back to December 6th. That is the most December 6th? We're not going that far back. Well, recently. That, I'm, I'm talking about the December 6th one right now. You look at some. Just because you've been bumped up to first chair in the orchestra doesn't mean you can compose a symphony. And that was around the time that Freddie Kitchens was promoted. I just don't think Peppers has much thoughts on Freddie Kitchens. Hey, just because you've been bumped up. To- but you know what? I can imagine. That was like a week after, too. I can imagine. Or, or well, a week after, so that means it was the Eagle game, I guess. And they didn't. What was the date on it? December 6th? December 6th. So that was after the Dolphins game. Okay, after the Dolphins game. So maybe it was a Mike Lennon tweet. Maybe. I don't know. Um, I can imagine the defense. This is a team game. And, Bobby, you've been on teams before. Not at a high level, but you've been on a lot of teams before. I can imagine the defense does feel some sort of, or some teammates feel some sort of animosity Yes, because I was on an offense that scored a bunch of points, and the defense gave a bunch of points, and we literally would say, you know, you know, like they they we would run a dr- like an O line D line drill, and all of a sudden our D line is running a bunch of stunts and like taking advantage of the drill, and our offensive line coach is talking to us. It's like we're the ones who got to fucking score, outscore other teams because of them. They want to come and bullshit this drill, like stuff stuff like that, you know. So so yes, it's very much so. 
Uh, I can see a defense. And because an offense is supposed – defense, I can see it being mu- that much bigger. So, yeah. Six weeks out of surgeries has me feeling like a complete. That one's self-explanatory. Yes. Pay her rent if the for the year if she's been acting right. I enjoyed that one. I enjoyed it, but it's like for the you year. Know what? Don't don't pay her rent. Like if you're married, you you get you live together, but don't be paying people's rent. It's real peppers, you know better. You come on, man. You know better than that. For the what, year. What time did he? Yeah, he tweeted that at eleven o'clock a.m. Man, he wasn't even drinking. Um, let's see lyrics. He goes to the Candlewick. Got the Oculus too. Once you choose that side, stay there. Mm. I don't know what that means. I think he's a player who's not playing football. He's hurt and he has more time on his hands. That's what I think. But that one sounds like something cryptic about the December twenty first. Trust who? Doing my thing, but I'm down to come clean. Not like you. That sounds hmm. like a song lyric, Justin. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> good to have me on your side. I ain't saying that you need me. That one could be like you, like I, I'm a good player, but you say uh, you don't need me, but. Um, and then he tweeted today, is it harder to get 10 plus sacks or 10 plus interceptions? Which is and like, come on, man, you, you know the answer to that one. 10 plus so, interceptions. <laughs> so I, I, I'm not reading too much into them. I am very interested to see what happens with Pep, though. I mean, he had this injury. He's you know, Someone's going to sign your real Peppers to at least some decent money. Um, since I, I, you, know, and I, you know I love Pep. And I, like I said, if I get fully healthy Pep versus fully healthy Logan Ryan, I'm taking Pep 10 times out of 10. Nine, eh, eight times out of 10, I'll say. Eight times out of ten. All right, next question. This is the last one. Trader Joe, can you take up a collection of talking Giants fans so we can buy the team from the Maras? This question had me thinking today. Isn't it kind of crazy? It's like we have a GM who you know earned his way into football, and a head coach who's coached, and scouts who have you know worked their way up, and. And it's like, I have a lot of money. I run this, though, and I can make decisions on it. Like that's, We got to get like athletes and coaches to be able to buy, rich enough to buy franchises. Because it's like, they th- these people shouldn't be running football teams. Like, John Mayer shouldn't be, he has no qualifications to run a football team. You know? Like, literally, like, like you, 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 there's no qualifications. Hmm. So how do we get John Mayer out of that seat? Hmm. Like, I would do a better job at running the Giants than John Mayer. Yeah. I think so. Now, maybe I maybe I would want to meddle a little bit. And I would, and I would say stuff like, Peppers is better than Logan Ryan. And Patrick Graham's like, but I want to run my scheme. And Logan Ryan's more valuable for that. Um, so maybe, maybe I wouldn't. Maybe I'm putting the bar so low. Like at John Mayer at that, uh, um, so I don't know, but it's just frustrating. Like, I'm just the past two weeks have to me, I haven't been like, I'm so down on Judge or I'm so down on Jones or so down on whoever. It's just like, I'm just so down on like John Mayer or even get him. Like, I'm just so down on like, it seems like John Mayer just is gonna. Every, even even if he gets something right and somebody like gets a higher right, it's just like he's going to do one thing that's going to screw up every offseason. Like every offseason, there's going to be one John Mayer thing that screws up the offseason. The fun thing is that we know it this time. Yeah. We know yeah. it. Um, that's what's fun about it. And that's why – that's another – that's a big, a, a big reason why I don't like Gettleman. And it's like Gettleman plays Mayer. Like he knows what to say to get Mayer to be happy and keep his job. And I get job pre- preservation as part of the – preservation is part of the job but it's like we need someone to come in and like and i always bring this example off of nick saban going and, and interviewing at alabama and telling them everything that was wrong and it pissing off some of the people and the other people being like no this is what we need we're not a we're not a good like i don't know what you call colleges right now we're not a good organization right now um you know like we need someone like that and that's what when we did the gm joe judge you know the behind the scenes do this right joe judge stuff where you hear like you know a guy like steven vetteroso being fired um you know firing colombo halfway through the year who colombo was an extraordinarily bad offensive line coach and still doesn't have a job um so um uh, being third so you know trading trading back so uh all right 
That was the last question. Let me check up Twitter real quick to check up on Pat. Has Pat Hanlon tweeted again? No, he has not. That's exactly what I was looking at. I was looking at to see if there was any update to the uh, Pat Hanlon versus uh, Steve uh, Verderosa. No updates. Pat Hanlon's getting a ratioed, which is nice, that he has more replies to his tweets than likes. Oh, NFL scout veteran, which I kind of hate those Twitter accounts too. It's like I was a former scout and have big followers. Here's a little advice from somebody who doesn't have the right to be giving advice. If you want to become an NFL scout, don't have social media and well, this don't is tweet out your takes. Scout and... No, I'm just saying in general. Because oh, yeah, that's dumb. Steve Verderosa, one week ago, if you asked me who he was and you told me his resume, I'd probably say. Sure. Even though he got fired, he probably knows more football than than I do. Now he started his Twitter account, and now he started tweeting. And I am fairly confident that I know more about football than Stephen Verderosa. And it is simply because he started a Twitter account and started giving his opinions. This NFL scout veteran, you know, who's tweeted about the Giants, who I guess used to be a, a scout in the NFL, he actually his quote tweet is perfect. This is this perfectly sums up how stupid Pat Hanlon. Versus Steven Verderoso is. Pat, I saw this, and I will partially back, uh, back you both up. Steven absolutely should have been gone long ago. Previous GMs talked with close friends that they wanted him gone. But Mara protected him. You guys not letting him go 15 years ago is the smallest mistake you guys have made, though. Like, that is my that is my thoughts exactly. So I don't even care if that guy's legit or not. Um, and then he says, that doesn't mean that Steve is wrong about current issues, though, because I never worked with you guys, but I've heard horror stories on the road for the last six years. I'm happy to DM to be honest. You do very good job, but Mary needs to fire several in person. So, yeah, it's it's it, Pat Hanlon. You're supposed to do PR. That doesn't help. Like, come on, man. No. How, how, why do you think that helps? So, whatever. No, the, no, the more that Pat Hanlon feels the need to respond to somehow explain the dumpster fire that is the Giants. Damn, Giants and daily the, replied to him saying Steven needs a medium Pepsi. And then the more that Steven Verderosa tweets, the worse the, the worse he makes him look and the better he makes the Giants look. <laughs> it's it's bad. It's a bad situation. I'm is team a Steve very, Verderosa very bad though now. Situation. Steve team Steve I'm team everybody shut up. Like just shut up. No, I don't care if Verderoso keeps talking. I think it's funny. Um, and Glock Roach bullying him is like the funniest. Like I'm living, I'm living vicariously through through him doing that. I love how many how, how I love we how really this... got to try and get him on Superman Radio. So if you see me tweeting at him to try and get him on the number one Giants podcast, just know it's actually not coming on Talking Giants. It'll be on Simple Man Radio. Um, I love how this is two episodes now where Steven Verderoso is a huge conversation point. But if you just look through his timeline and then think to yourself, well, what's the first thought that comes to my brain? Then it has to be, you know what, Stephen? That's a really good observation that you just made. He doesn't provide any kind of, like, substance. It's just like, this player plays for that team. This player got a second contract. This player was drafted by the Giants. It's like, yup, Stephen, you did a great job of summarizing what's happening in the NFL right now. Thanks, bud. Linville Joseph was drafted by the Giants. Linville Joseph was not re-signed by the Giants. Linville Joseph was signed by the Vikings. He is no longer on the Giants. He is still a starter for the Chargers. Like, thanks. That's that's exactly what happened, bud. And Glock made a good point. It's like, dude, you got to get some more takes besides Dave Gettleman bad. Don't uh, promote Kevin Abrams. Like, let's let's hear about some other scouts in the organization that probably deserve to be fired. Like, give us some real info. We all know Dave Gettleman's bad. We all know promoting Kevin Abrams is bad besides Lawrence Tynes. Like, we already know that. Um, Tell me how good that University of Houston quarterback looked in uh, in 1993, who was like a top 10 bust of all time. Tell me about how good he looked like good. in shorts. Um, Tell me about so, that. So that's an episode. We'll be back Friday with a preview. Bringing back an interview with Robert K. Smith, who's been on the show every single year. Wow. Not even because I think he's going to get, like, he will give us some good info, but it's like, I just want to talk to my friend Robert. We both came up at the same time. Like, you know, the first time I talked to him, we had 200 followers. It was a 2018 Bears playoff game. Um, So looking forward to that with Robert. He's he's, he's my guy. So so uh, we'll have that. And we might have another special interview, but it's it, we might not. So I'm not going to say on. who it, I'm not going to say who it is. Uh, so we appreciate you guys. We'll be back on Friday. Until then, let's go.
big blue.